Good afternoon, humans. It is June 8th, Saturday, and last night I attended an event called The Attack on Our Second Amendment Rights. It was at Kearsage High School. Uh, very informative, uh, th so a big thank you to the panelists who participated. Um, I did want to respond, however, though, to uh, some of what was said by some of the panelists there. Um, so last night's event, um, one of the, de in the description it read, uh, the principles of Marxism have gone full throttle in an attempt to oppress Americans and their natural rights. Um, went on to talk about what is, what are the attacks on the Second Amendment, who's behind them. Um, this will be discussed. Um, now in terms of Marxism, I'll get to the Marxism part later. Um, but the three panelists were Dan Wos, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, W-O-S. He wrote a book called uh, Good Gun, Bad Guy, or maybe I have that backwards, Bad, bad Guy, Good Gun. Um, the book about uh, firearms, statistics on shootings. Um, another panelist was Kimberly Morin, who's with the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. Uh, they're known for putting on a lot of uh, pro-gun political events and also training uh, people with firearms. And also Keith Hansen was the third panelist, and uh, he's known for a very conservative talk show that he hosts on the radio. Um, the panel itself was hosted by Josh Moore, who's a former state representative. Early on, many of the panelists talked about uh, what, what they believe is the background for the right to defend yourself with a firearm, and they cited it as a natural right. They said it exists outside of the Constitution, which I thought was a very good point. Um, there was a lot of allusion to religious things, gods, uh, religious undertones, rights coming from God or a creator. And um, I guess that's fine for people that are into that sort of thing. Um, for non-theists such as myself, we view rights as to stem from our individual self-ownership and our custodianship of ourselves. So self-ownership was a word that I felt was kind of absent from last night's discussion within the context of where does this natural right come from? Why is it a natural right to defend yourself? Um, so we, we derive, self from self-ownership derives self-responsibility, and from that responsibility to defend ourselves and our loved ones uh, exists that natural right of self-defense, whether that be with the tool of a firearm or whatever other tool is in no way offensive to others. And uh, I think a good place to draw the line on weapons is, are these weapons, is the possession of them in and of itself harmful to others? With a firearm, no, unless you actually choose to shoot someone with it, it's not inherently harmful. Um, Radioactive weapons, of course, may not fit that that uh, example. If you're living in the suburbs, you have radioactive weapons. They can't really be seen as defensive because they're inherently offensive with the uh, pollution and uh, damage they put out. So, off off topic there a little bit. Um, so, getting back to this this natural uh, rights thing, uh, Karen Testerman is a former candidate for state rep. She was in the audience and she made a, a good point. At one point, she said, "To frame things as constitutional rights." limits that right um, to be within the context of being a right from the Constitution, so as to say, if that right from the Constitution is amended away, you no longer have that right. So I thought that was a very good point that you made. Um, a good student of history would be aware that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the Constitution are very clear in the nature of basic rights in that they exist and belong to the people regardless of whether or not they are enumerated in that Bill of Rights. Now that being said, um, when's the last Supreme Court case that actually said um, a right that is not recognized in the Constitution still exists and we will protect it? Um, now we can, we can find out what those natural rights were at the time that that was written if we want to um, based on what was written by the people who wrote that Constitution and uh, other similar documents. Now one of the problems I had is that I got the impression that the inherent right to self-defense, um, even though it was being called a natural right, presumably a natural right that all humans have, I got the impression from at least two of the speakers on the panel that there was an asterisk included in that natural right, and the asterisk would have said at the end, applies only to U.S. citizens, um, based on some of the statements they made later on. I'll get to that. Or I should say people federally recognized as U.S. citizens. Um, you can see in Dan's opening statement, uh, as I uploaded it, where he makes an awkward comment about the root causes of violence, and shifting from the focus on the tools uh, used, shifting the focus away from the tools used to commit violence. Um, I totally understand that the, the tools used to commit violence are not the causes of violence; they're not the root of violence, um, and that was a good point. But then he um, he said something very strange about shifting the focus to. Uh, 
things that are root causes like open borders and sanctuary cities and welfare. And that seemed very strange. How is uh, an open border or sanctuary cities or welfare tie into the idea of, of people misusing firearms or, or committing violence? Um, so I unfortunately failed to hit the record button. I asked him a question about that when the question and answer session came up. Um, but I did record the, the interaction that followed with Dan and Keith on the panel. We had a, I had a little bit of a back and forth, more so with uh, like Keith towards the end. Um, and I'll ex I found some of their statements troublesome. I'm going to explain why I find them troublesome. Um, so my question to Dan after he made those statements um, about the, the causes of violence was um, I asked how or why he connected open borders and sanctuary cities with the roots of violence or the sources of violence. And I asked if he believed that New Hampshire's open border with Vermont was somehow a cause of violence or a source of violence, because it, why are we being specific about one political designation over another, like a criminal could theoretically come from anywhere, go to anywhere, so what is it that's so special about this, you know, line in the south? I didn't say all, all that, but that's what I was trying to imply. Um, where the video comes in, Dan responds that um, the violence of, he says, well, no, the travel is not the problem. The violence of people from other countries is the problem, which is still, in, in a sense, to say that because they're allowed to travel, like, there's some sort of uh, violence that they're capable of committing. Um, and I pointed out that the worst firearm-related terrorist attack, and it wasn't presumably had no motive behind terrorism, was committed by a seemingly ordinary American citizen, um, with presumably no motive behind, beyond just bloodlust and insanity. It wasn't a, presumably a political thing or, or to make any sort of statement as far as anyone knows. Um, so Dan insists that he wasn't implying travel itself causes crime, but he goes on to make a false statement that undocumented people commit a greater proportion of crime than uh, native-born Americans. Now, there have been studies on this. There are peer-reviewed studies. You can just Google it. Uh, you can see a variety of things there that have found the opposite of that assertion. Undocumented immigrants and, um, and immigrants in general commit far less reported crime, are incarcerated at far lower of a rate than native-born Americans. It's been studied multiple times in multiple places, and every time they've come up with a similar trend. So, I have a bit of an issue with the implication he made that was different. Now, he, it seemed like he was playing a little bit of a numbers game where he said, oh, well, the numbers of them are so low that it doesn't seem like it, but they're committing a big proportion of crimes. And I said, no, it's just the opposite. They are quite a large number of people, an estimated 15 to 20 million undocumented people. And unless you're going to attribute every single uh, unsolved crime to an undocumented person, they are committing a far smaller proportion of crimes uh, that's, that are being detected. Um, so that was something I took issue with. That was something, and I, and I would point him to, uh, I think it's, I don't know if I wrote them down here, some, some studies. Oh, Cato. Cato published uh, an analysis, this was March 4th of this year that uh, summarizes some of the stuff I've been saying and uh, numerous studies throughout the, the United States have studied different immigrant communities and they talk about the difficulties of also studying undocumented immigrant things because of the nature of their lifestyle because they have to live so underground that you can't really keep total track of, of what they're doing for their own safety. Um, so it was at this point that, that Keith sort of interjected into, into this uh, back and forth that I was having with Dan and what he interjected to say, it was, it was kind of disturbing, it gave me like, like sort of like 1940s European war-torn country vibes. Um, and I mean, you can guess which ones, not the nice ones. Uh, but uh, what he did is, uh, he said something like along the line of, I just want to say that every single person who walks across that line without permission is a criminal. That's, that's period, end of story. He said, it, paraphrasing very closely what he said to that, it was like a great denunciation of these people. How dare they cross that line across the continent? And, um, I, I mean, I, it's, not, it's not something that's kind of out of left field. Well, it's a, a funny way I worded that unintentionally out of left field. Imagine back in the day when um, we were raised on, I remember when I was a kid, one of the most shocking images of... Uh, of my childhood that I remember of like, whoa, that's what the government looks like, the scary part, was the Elian Gonzalez case. And regardless of how one feels about whether this child should be in Cuba or this child should be in the United States, it was really disturbing when 
we saw a bunch of armed thugs, really fat, disgusting looking men, armed to the teeth, wearing goggles, looking like they're ready to go to war with machine guns, and they're storming a house. And that photographer got a really brave shot um, that day um, when he, he crawled in the window, he was waved in as, as the SWAT was raiding the house. Um, and the, you see that cop with the machine gun, those multiple cops, the machine guns right in this, this screaming, crying child's face. I think Alien Gonzalez was, what, six or seven years old then? Um, so to me, that stood out. That was like the Democratic president was, I mean, Bill Clinton wasn't, it was more so a Janet Reno, I think, than a Bill Clinton thing, because he seemed more of a hands-off president. But in the same sense, you see that evil, like, authoritarian um, trend there that was this police state thing of this is how we solve problems. We get the machine guns, we get the body armor, we go in there pointed right at you, screaming in your face. Um, Waco and Ruby Ridge were, of course, like, watershed moments of back then, and I feel like it was very disturbing, it disturbed people, and it, there was almost like a trend against that, like, this was something from the past, this is that Cold War thing. And uh, it seemed like there was a, a, a period where we moved away from that militarism up until maybe 9-11, and then that ch changed things in a different direction, where now it's all about the troops, it's all about the military, it's all about the police. Um, and we've seen, you know, a little bit of a divide since then as things have, as the tide has shifted backwards. Um, but I point this out because some people clapped when, when uh, Keith denounced undocumented immigrants as criminals. And uh, the, the policy, I, I pointed out that the policy that Keith was lauding and saying, like, this is U.S. law and they broke it. These are Soviet policies. These are Nazi policies. These are policies that were adopted from some very evil empires. These were not U.S. laws based in previous U.S. law. These are things that came about from a very dark time in history, in World War One, World War Two. Um, and he also he then also began citing Mexican immigration laws, which, by the way, are uh, unenforced. We'll get onto that. Before making the next point, um, I think we should consider that Keith chose to defend U.S. policy by citing Mexican policy that he thinks is really strict. Um, now, that policy is it's officially unendorsed. In fact, I got a quote from... Um, I wish I had written the guy's name down. Mexican, The Mexican foreign minister, I didn't write down his name, but uh, there was an article about migration into Mexico and out of Mexico recently, and, and the trend is reversing. More people are migrating to Mexico from the Americas, both native-born American citizens and previous Mexican nationals than the opposite right now. Um, and so in that study, the Mexican foreign minister is quoted as saying, we have never pressured uh, them to have documents in order. By them, he means people immigrating to Mexico or just traveling to Mexico, choosing to stay there. Um, and I would back that up by when I traveled to Mexico this summer, uh, when I got to the border, they never asked anything about uh, papers. They just said, you don't have guns or ammunitions or weapons. We said, no, and they said, have a good time. Um, so, citing Mexican law, citing bad laws of other countries, which, by the way, aren't enforced and shouldn't be, um, is in no way an excuse for bad laws here. Why would somebody presume that if something is bad in another place that we should mirror that? It should be the opposite. It should be if a place has a bad law, we don't have the bad law. We have the free place where people can choose to do one thing or another, and uh, things even out because people can choose to associate with groups that share their preferences or not. There is no defense for Soviet or Nazi policies to be enacted in the U.S. just because other countries may do that. So let's leave the, the, the dark things in the past, so the 1940s policies, the wartime policies. Um, this is where I must contend that the asterisk qualification of natural rights only for U.S. citizens becomes clear, because when, when Keith was denouncing the immigrants, um, if you can't travel to the U.S. without being a criminal, unless you literally win a lottery and then pay a permit, and, which includes exorbitant amounts of money and lawyers, um, to the, pay in the federal mafia, how can you claim that it's a natural right? Because clearly Mexicans don't have this right to self-defense. They don't have the right to have guns under the Mexican laws. So if they try and flee to a place where they can have that freedom, you'll call them a criminal for fleeing the bad place to go to the good place? Um, that's why the, the connection between the Berlin Wall is so strong, and especially considering how this president is currently uh, pressuring or trying to pressure using taxes other countries into changing their own policies. Now, how is that not, this This country should not be meddling in other countries, let alone the president unilaterally doing this sort of thing. But I'm getting a little off base of, of where I wanted to focus. Um, 
which is, for the sake of consistency, I would ask Keith to stop claiming that he believes of the natural right to self-defense, unless he's going to also claim that not only U.S. citizens are entitled to the right to self-defense. Because right now it seems to be only U.S. citizens, and he stands by that. He's like, that's the law, and we enforce the law. Um, but what's the point of, of going to these... Uh, these gatherings and learning about like you should disobey the gun laws if the next words out of their mouth are just gonna be Well, you better obey these other laws that are about victimless crimes about people that aren't hurting anybody And we'll still lock them in cages as though they're rapists and as though they're murderers and robbers and thieves and treat them just the same um, So it does seem it, it almost gives a disingenuous vibe to it There was talk about this isn't a left-right issue, but as soon as something like that comes up It's like it makes it one because when it's the other side's unjust, uh, when it's your, it's one side's unjust law, it's okay, the other side's isn't, and it just depends on the issue. If there was ideological consistency, the natural right um, would mean that folks who live in Mexico should also have a right to defend themselves. But to Keith, if someone is being denied the right to defend themselves and they flee, they're a criminal. Um, that's wrong because people should not, they, a right to flee should be an inherent right. Like, self-defense is great, you should be able to stand your ground, but fleeing should also be an option. Whether it's a, a fight in a particular location you try and run away from, or whether it's a government that's trying to oppress you, or a gang that's trying to oppress you. Everyone should have the right to physically move themselves away from something that makes them uncomfortable. That, I would see, think, is a, a natural human right. It's definitely not an aggression to flee something that is bad. Um... But it, it really did concern me that it's it just reflected that I'm a proud citizen, I proudly enforce these laws, and it's like the, the same people that would come after your guns are doing that same thing for those laws. So consider the parallels. Uh, a, ma a major point Keith seems to discount with his denunciation of unlicensed travelers is his neglect to recognize the privileged status of U.S. citizens in Mexico versus the second class and or criminal status of Mexican citizens in the United States. Um, he tried to claim, like, oh, the laws in Mexico are so much harsher. No, they're not. They treat us better. We're legally allowed to be there for a long period of time before we technically be supposed to sign up as residents or whatever. They say that they don't even enforce that. Um, so trying to say that, like, they are bad, so we should be almost as bad. What sort of argument is that? Um, so folks with legal Mexican passports, U.S. citizens, I, I'm a U.S., I'm called a U.S. citizen, and I, I reside in New Hampshire, um, we have the right to walk up to the Mexican border. If they care to see our passport, we can show it. You don't have to have a passport. Um, the U.S. suggests it, so it makes re-entry easier. But uh, you can just go right in. They don't care. They're, they're happy to have you. They're happy to have the commerce. They understand that this is a good trade thing, that people bring money, people spend money, people have a good time, they invite more people. That's a natural thing. The more you put barriers to that, the less of that you have. Um, so. My U.S. passport, it gets me across that border, no problem. A Mexican passport does not provide that privilege for the United States. You still need to obtain a visa just if you want to go shopping across the river uh, for, for the day. And I don't understand that because I'm somebody who exercised that right in Mexico. I was happy to, and, and I was glad they, wel they were so welcoming, and I enjoyed the food I ate there and you know had a good time, didn't have any bad experiences. Um, and yet they want to... It's like these people are like criminals that aren't allowed to come here, like they're automatically suspect, and that, that's something that's very wrong. So, um, until one recognizes that there is an inherent uh, backwardsness to this, we don't have the same rights. We are privileged, they are not. They are second-class citizens and or criminals if they come here. Even, even if they come here with a visa, you're still a second-class citizen, you still can't have the gun to defend yourself, which is why we were at that... Uh, that that talk yesterday, was it about our rights to defend ourselves in this country? Or is it about anyone's right to defend themselves in this country? Are we saying that undocumented people or even legal immigrants might never be attacked? Because guess what? Legal immigrants also can't have guns. Until you're a citizen, you can't buy them. So, um, there is a lot of... There, when trying to defend the Second Amendment or people's right to self-defense, if people are going to call things natural rights, they need to make sure that it's extending all the way to people, um, to everyone. It's a natural right of all peoples, not just this group or that group in this area, and that magic soil and all that, that nonsense. Um, so nothing about this system resembles freedom in any way. It's, I mean, it's freedom for U.S. citizens to have fun and have a good time. 
But uh, while we're neglecting that those other people do not have that privilege, they can't just come visit us if we want them to. If I make a friend on the other side of the border, I can't just bring them across and say, hey, come visit me, come visit my home. Um, and that's wrong. Why can't I make friends on the other side of the border and, ha and have those invitations without having to get the authorization of Uncle Sam, Agent Orange? Or, or let's put it this way, if it was uh, Barack Obama when he was in office and uh, you had a friend from another country and you didn't like him, would you have, would you have liked that? Because I know this, there's a lot of the, the uh, partisanship of like it was okay when Obama did it and now it's not okay when Trump does it and vice versa. There were people that took issue with what Obama did, Trump's doing it, we'll give it a pass. And I see, you see that issue on both sides. Um, in the video I referencing traveling to Mexico by foot this summer, and uh, I was glad that I was able to do that. Like in retrospect, I didn't really think much of taking the little trip at the time, but considering all the terrible things people have said about Mexico in the, in the time since, like I can say I physically walked there. It was not scary. It was not dangerous. There, the uh, the one scary Mexican authority guy I saw with like a machine gun, military looking guy. He was the one that was watching the cars as they came through. If you walk through, you get a nice guy in a t-shirt that just like asks what you're doing for the day and, and tells you to have a good time. Just don't bring in any guns or weapons. Um, and on the way back, they didn't really, it seemed like they were bored and lazy because I guess not a lot of people walk on the American side. They were just, uh, wanted to see the passports. I had bought some stuff there and I went to show it to him. He didn't really seem all that interested in looking at it. Same as like on the Mexican border, the guy just like asked what we had in our bags but didn't really want to look in them. So I was uh, glad about that, but I also think that's, I mean, a privilege of I look like an American person, I sound American, uh, United States American, specifically. Um, and I, I can't imagine many people walk across there just because the, the heat, it's difficult, they drive, and lots of cars are being tossed. Um, that's not free trade. Why can't people just bring goods back and forth? And it's terrible that they're using taxation, which uh, conservatives are supposedly against as a means to leverage these countries to change their policies. Um, to me, that seems like a major exploitation of government power, but that wasn't really what the uh, meeting last night was about, but these are tangential issues that I think really tie into it. Um, not that any level of harshness on the part of the Mexican border authorities would at all justify harshness here, or policies of harshness here, but the reason this is relevant is to deconstruct the commonly misconstrued narrative that um, Keith was asserting that somehow Mexico is tough and savage on immigration and people traveling there, and they're not. Um, abuses elsewhere are never an excuse for abuses here. Um, people who believe in human rights, which includes self-defense and the right of self-ownership, need to be consistent in asserting these same rights for everyone. Um, or else we're going to be righteously be labeled hypocrites. If, if you're claiming it's this is a natural right but only for this group, well, what is it? That's not a natural right. That's a, a group privilege, to be specific. Um, the inconsistency of principles extends beyond the concerns of natural rights, but also into the sphere of the constitutional rights. Um, Keith made a few appeals to the Bill of Rights, and um, I would invite him to check out Amendments 9 and 10, which we can clearly see um, were an indication that there were recognized rights that the founders did not enumerate in that document, and they said that. They said, you still have those other rights. Um, how do we figure out what those other rights were? Well, we can look to the other documents which they wrote that assert why they think that they had those rights. Um, one of them where it becomes obvious is in the governing document of the time before the Constitution, what was considered the first Constitution. The fourth article of the Articles of Confederation pretty specifically states that uh, the people of the states have the right to freely and unmolestedly travel between the states and to trade between the states. Um, this is clear, it opens and it clarifies with to better secure perpetual and up. Uh, excuse me, to better secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of different states in this union. So they didn't want states to be setting up their own borders and saying, like, this group can't come in, we're only trading with these, and creating these little trade alliances. They wanted there to be a free, um, a place of free trade, free travel, free exchange, free people mingling between these contiguous states. Um, the current U.S. federal laws are clearly unconstitutional, as anyone except the living document crowd um, who pretend the Ninth and Tenth Amendments don't exist would assert, um, because where in the Constitution is Congress given the power to control immigration? 
They are given specific powers. Immigration is not once listed. What is listed, quite specifically, is naturalization. Naturalization is the process by which one becomes a citizen. So clearly there was in mind of the founders the idea that just because you come here, you're not automatically a citizen of the United States, but we will create a process by which people can become citizens. Maybe they'd create the process for people to do it from outside of the US, maybe it would just be inside. It's not really specified in there. But what is clear is that they didn't give Congress this power to tell people that they can't travel, or especially not to be restricting, uh, as the, the Supreme Court's given ICE an incredibly outrageous powers like this 100 miles on the border nonsense, which is, by the way, where most of the population of the United States lives. They're claiming the Fourth Amendment doesn't exist. They can just search for, uh, for runaway uh, immigrants at any time. And it's, it's very reminiscent of the fugitive slave laws, um, in the sense of these people have, are somewhere they're not supposed to be. And uh, I guess they're, they're supposed to be a slave to that place. It's like instead of the plantation now, you're a slave to your nation. And uh, that, that is really a disturbing concept, especially considering that back in the day in these other countries, arrival was the legal process. Um, a lot of people say, like, my ancestors did it the legal way. Guess what the legal way was? Physically traveling there, which people are doing and getting arrested for now. So that's, that's really not appropriate. Um, and so that's why with this constitutional issue, uh, yeah, please find the place in the Constitution where the Congress is authorized to write any of these awful laws they've written that prevent people from traveling or tell them they can't do business or commerce or enter or visit the United States. Um, one thing I'd like for the panelists to consider, Kim not so much included since she really didn't say anything disparaging of immigrants, is the mention of, uh, or the, there was a mention of how elements of the anti-gun group have this strong emotional bitterness and hatred um, for the pro-gun folks, and it was kind of framed as though, like, well, the pro-gun one is a side of like logic and statistics. The anti-gun is like hysteria and fear of the of the tool. Um, of course, if those people had their way, the the bad people that want to ban guns, um, and all the guns are banned, they'd no doubt be deriding the people who resisted the gun conversations as criminals, um, as you know, as people that needed to be locked in jail, and you. I've, you can hear that passion in some of these anti-gun people, like them, some of those California folks that uh, want to ban, like, they have these little petty rules of, like, magazine sizes and things like that. You can hear the passion where they're like, those people with those big round mags, those are criminals, they only want to harm people. And it just, I really saw a strong parallel between that, the passion in those types of people and the passion I heard from Keith about every single one of those people who crosses that border is a criminal. Um, so, that, yeah, that is really concerning, and um, I'd, I'd invite those folks to consider those parallels and how if they want to stand out as not being the side of hatred and unrational, uh, irrational uh, hatred of others and criminalization of others, then consider where they're doing that. It's, it's a, an extreme hatred and criminalization to say that someone's not allowed to travel above a line in the continent. That's kind of a big deal. I mean, the United States is very big. It's one thing uh, if people wanted to form little small communities places and say we're selective about who comes in. They call those gated communities. Those are legit because they're by consent. The people within them decide we're going to live in this community, this is our place, we'll restrict who comes in. But when an entire uh, group of people like the federal government or even a state government, they do things without our consent. No, I don't consent to any walls being built. I don't want to live in a prison. Um, that's, I mean, that's obviously, it's not just a violation of those people's rights who aren't allowed to cross that line. It's a violation of my rights as well for the interactions I want to have with those people that can't cross those lines. Um, so th there's multiple ways in which this, is, uh, this issue is, is very important to freedom, and yet it's still totally ignored, and people who claim to be for freedom will still parade, uh, parade around the idea of fascist and Soviet policies. Um, so maybe our society would be a whole lot healthier if all people who wanted to condemn people for breaking harmless, victimless, unconstitutional laws, would instead focus their attention towards actual criminals, people who are causing some sort of injury to another person. If there isn't a direct injury being caused, you probably shouldn't be getting that upset about whatever the issue is. Um, so don't, I'd invite both sides, don't go after peaceful gun owners for owning something that's not harming someone else, and uh, any of these gun owners that are anti-immigrant, don't be going after immigrants because they traveled here. Um, they're, they're probably wanting to be in a place where they have more rights. Most people aren't like naturally opposed to their own rights unless they're sort of indoctrinated in that direction. So someone that flees that indoctrination usually isn't. 
um, totally going to be susceptible to that their entire life. It's called assimilation. People tend to assimilate very well. Um, so those, those are the major points about the immigration thing I wanted to make. But another was uh, to this Marxism. Now, I explained that the, the event itself was labeled as, uh, like, Marxist stuff is, is like, uh, having an impact on society. And I think that's, that's a good point to be made there, but it doesn't, it doesn't at all relate to the Second Amendment. And here's why. Um, so the, the Communist Manifesto, which was referenced last night, um, it has ten planks at the end of it. It's a pretty simple way of saying it. it summarizes it and says, like, the goals of, of uh, Marxist communism there in that particular treatise. Um, most of the planks are things that the U.S. government has already instituted since that time period. So, I, I mean, it... it so it's, it's pretty ludicrous or silly when people do all this, uh, Marxism is coming, Marxism is coming, it's, which, which part of Marxism? I mean, there's already so much of it that's just ingrained into American society that how is it, uh, it's not, it's not shocking any, to people, it's not even shocking to conservatives, and here's why, many of these things are, are ideas that some conservatives will totally get behind, the immigration thing included. Um, plank one, abolition of private property and land rents. Guess what, it's called the property tax, land rent. Um... Number two, uh, progressive graduated income tax. Other countries definitely worse than the U.S., but we certainly have that here, yeah. Um, you can get, though, of course, you can get around that by uh, making your corporation make the money and, like, crap like that, you know, like flipping the bank accounts, all that, whatever. I'm, I'm not a, an incredibly wealthy person. I don't get into that. But from what I understand, you can keep a good amount of money if you, you put your mind to it. And, you know, all power to people. F taxes. Um, Number three, abolition of inheritance rights. That kind of goes with number two, heavy inheritance tax. Number four, confiscation of property of emigrants and rebels. Um, yeah, guess what? They're locking people up on the border for leaving water for migrants. They're facing prison time. As though, like, they're helping enemy soldiers or something when they're just giving people water so they don't die. And then we see ICE agents out in the desert dumping out these bottles of water like they want people to die. How do you think that's supposed to make people think about those people? Like, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to not see the parallels between all of the worst parts of history, you know? Um, people who do things like that are kind of the enemies of humanity. People that leave water for peaceful people are helpers. People that hurt those people are evil people. Um, the rest of the, the planks... Uh, centralized credit in the hands of the state is number five. Yeah, we get the Federal Reserve Bank. They mess with the interest rates. Uh, number six, centralization of communications and transport. Well, that border thing really is a centralization of transport, is it? If you try and transport across that border, uh, you're going to be met with some pretty centralized authority figures called ICE. Uh, regardless of your feelings on that, that is something, that's a Marxist idea. So it, people that endorse that are endorsing Marxist ideology that he pioneered in this document. Now, granted, it wasn't implemented until the 20th century, and this was written in the 1800s. Um, but if you are endorsing this divide-the-continent-border ideology, you are endorsing plank number six of communism. Um, and then the, the communications part, NSA. They're listening to everything. We already know that. Edward Snowden. Um, 789 deal with building an agricultural army. Um, and number 10 is state education. The state education one is interesting because at the event last night, there was a lot of talk about uh, the state education, the government schools are bad. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that's very true, why people should not have their kids in government school if they can. Um, however, there were some things I learned in government school that I feel like caused me to be aware and discount some of the ideas being perpetuated that I was speaking about that uh, are troublesome. Um, I do remember when we learned about World War II, I went through Concord schools mostly here in New Hampshire. Um, we learned about how the Soviets and the Nazis and a lot of the European countries when they were at war had these travel bans and travel restrictions and a lot of innocent civilians died because they weren't able to flee places that were going to become war zones. And that was something that was seen as like what makes these people evil, the Nazis and the Soviets, is that they it was a crime to do these things that are not crimes, like traveling, and people lost their lives and got hurt because of it. And the fact that there is a, just a, a really strong cognitive dissonance of people that have adopted this anti-immigrant mentality, which I pointed out, 
was more so a, a line of the Democrats just 20 years ago and for some reason has been totally appropriated by conservatives and Republicans and it seems like a very Trumpian thing or at least it, we saw a rise with it with Trump and uh, I'm not sure why it is that conservatives and right-wing supposedly small government people are so happy to uh, overtake what I, as I said, appropriate this uh, this ideology from the left that they were kind of losing ground on because of the inconsistencies among their own ideologies of like universal human rights that they claim to purport. It couldn't. It's like that. Those bad ideas couldn't survive in the Democratic Party as backwards as it is, and now we're seeing it adopted to the Republicans, and it's uh, very concerning for me. Very concerning, I think, for the entire country, for the entire world, uh, as it relates to human freedom and human migration. Um, but who is the real Marxist here? It, the people that are supporting those uh, awful policies, including the people who claim to be for the Second Amendment who supported these policies, are, I'd say, actually the true Marxists. They're supporting this guy's ideas. But that being said, Marx is not, not on our side with, uh, with the firearms thing, unless of, um, uh, you know, depending on, on how you stand on this. Marx was very much in favor of the workers, the proletariat masses being armed. This was a guy that was advocating for armed insurrection, so of course he was saying, like, yeah, all you, all you peasants need to arm yourselves. Um, so the idea that, like, Marxism is somehow associated with being opposed to the Second Amendment or individual gun ownership is, to me, a very strange thing. Um, Marx was actually giving a talk before the... Uh, it was uh, one of the central committees of the Communist Party back in the day, um, and there had been, I believe, uh, some sort of uprising in Austria that involved an anti-capitalist sort of Marxist uh, idea force. And he thought that they were not well organized and not well armed, and he <clears throat> pleaded to the council that everyone must be armed, everyone must be trained. And so um, one, of the, one of the quotes from Marx that was like very specific to this point and these are his words. Under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered. Any attempt to disarm workers must be frustrated by force if necessary. So, <laughs> there are lots of bad things about Marxism. Um, Anti-gun, anti-weapon, anti-self-defense is not one of them. Um, and I'd say that seems to be a larger trend of uh, sort of right-leaning... It's, it, I think it started with sort of right-leaning intellectuals and is kind of in this sense seeped into regular culture is this idea of calling everything Marxism and uh, they even call it cultural Marxism. And, um, and actually there's a really great uh, there's a dialogue between two, uh, two great thinkers, Slavoj Žižek and Jordan Peterson, um, about it was supposed to be kind of about capitalism and Marxism. And at one point, uh, Žižek, who identifies as a Marxist but doesn't really defend Marxism in the traditional sense, um, he asked Peterson to identify who are these cultural Marxists that you are associating with this PC culture. Because um, PC culture, like the, the sensitivity culture, uh, Marx was not a, a sensitivity guy. He was a pretty uh, crass guy, like in terms of uh, speaking openly about what he thought of different groups and like different tactics and whatnot. So the idea of like uh, sanitize your language, speak in such a way that offends no one, um, that's not that's not really at all a Marxist idea, and yet it's because like PC culture is associated with the left, and the left is vaguely associated with Marxism. I think there's this uh, unnecessary tying of these these ideas together that don't necessarily jive. Um, so to I mean moving on from that, um, consider who the real Marxists are. Uh, the the government school did teach me about the Soviets and the uh, Nazi policies, but one thing they didn't teach about, and one thing I had to learn for myself, is where did the, this passport system come from? Because like that's uh, they had this whole like you need a passport, and you don't really need a passport because the United States just wants you to have a passport because it makes it easier for them, but they're still going to let you in the country if you're a legal citizen and you're trying to get back. So, passport system came from wartime. Um, wartime is not the best time to be crafting policy from, or to be adopting policy from, it makes sense within wartime to be concerned about people coming from a particular country you might be at war with. It does not make sense when it's peace and there is no war to just automatically assume everyone is probably a criminal or a spy or whatever coming from another country, which is kind of what the, the maintenance of that system does. Um, now, as I mentioned, the passport thing doesn't even matter in the context of Ma Mexican or other Latin Americans because the pa even a legal passport from their countries does not grant them access to the U.S. 
Um, government school didn't teach about the origins of Border Patrol. Uh, the origins of Border Patrol were to enforce the unconstitutional and overtly racist Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so, where does, it's in the same sense that it wasn't really mentioned uh, last night, but one of the things that could have been mentioned was the origins of gun control were, uh, was racist uh, laws to prevent certain groups of freed people from being able to defend themselves against people who thought they still should have been slaves or second-class citizens or not owned property, etc. Um, so, what is the history of Border Patrol? The history of Border Patrol was to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Act and to kick people out of the country because uh, this terrible law was written that these people that were brought here as workers no longer had rights and were going to be kicked out. Uh, another thing that isn't taught in school is about Chinese repa uh, excuse me, about uh, the Mexican repatriation of the 1920s and 30s, um, in which there was an organized ethnic cleansing campaign to kick legal U.S. citizens out of this country uh, for racist reasons. Uh, an estimated 60% of the people that were forcibly kicked out of this country and were terrorized out of this country uh, were legal U.S. citizens by birthright. And yet, um, we had this campaign in history that most people aren't even aware of that did exactly what they're trying to do today. And it's, it's like cleanse these people from our country, even though they're not criminals. They don't, they're not necessarily hurting people just because they're from the wrong place. Um, so uh, these are things that I, I would invite people to learn more about, read, read about the histories of. Um, it's not something that should be ignored. Um, to conclude, a free society is not a zero-sum game. It doesn't because there's more people. It doesn't mean we're less free. Um, there can be different independent and continuous communities as there are, and what we need to avoid is making it so that uh, these more tyrannical and authoritarian groups do not rule over all of us in ways we do not want to. Um, but I'm totally happy to have societies within this country where it's you totally uh, everyone speaking Spanish or nobody speaks English, and I think that's perfectly fine. There's no reason why there needs to be political divisions between different groups ethnically or uh, with, with language gaps of people. Um, let's all be consistent when we say we support equal natural rights. So that means for all people, not just a privileged group of people and make sure that it means we're not just blindly rallying behind the privileges of our protected class. Self-ownership is a universal principle, and we should all be able to get behind it regardless of our religious, ethnic, or national origins. It's uh, universally consistent, and I don't see why anyone should have to believe that, you know, certain rights belong to certain groups. Let's try and believe in consistency here, so. That is my message, that is my overview of the event. Um, thank you for the organizers for having it, it, it provoked some good thought. Um, however, of course, there's always more to get into whenever you have that sort of thing. So um, I appreciate anyone who has watched this far in uh, being able to understand that perspective, and I hope you give it some thought.